Objectives, we have tips to avoid plagiarism, how to evaluate a website, integrating digital literacy in the curriculum, and last, impact of the integrating digital curriculum in the classroom on teachers, families, and friends. Previous topic, we've discussed plagiarism and its type. In lieu with it, I will just discuss to you its definition before I proceed. Plagiarism is a practice of taking someone else's work and or ideas and passing them as one's own. So basically, you already know what plagiarism is. Let's proceed to its tips to avoid plagiarism. There are three steps to avoid plagiarism. Step 1. Keep track of your source. Sometimes, we forget to put the source on where our ideas came from. That's why keeping the track of our source is a great way to make sure that all the ideas are placed and it also allows us to easily go back to where our ideas came from for us to review it. Step 2. Quote and paraphrasing. When writing a paper, and if you want to share a piece of information from a source, you must either paraphrase or quote the original text. An example of quote is, Yes, we can. We put quotation mark and write the author's surname and its date of publication in an open and closed parenthesis. While an example of paraphrasing is, we need to use our own words to I explain the idea of the text. Step 3. Use Plagiarism Checker Most universities use Plagiarism Checker in students' work. Using Plagiarism Checker before turning in your paper will help you detect accidental plagiarism and understand plagiarism better, so that you can be sure that your paper is plagiarism-free. Because of the spreading of different information all over the internet, it is important to develop evaluation skills to access you to identify quality web page. There are six criteria that should be applied in evaluating a web page. First is authority, accuracy, objectivity, currency, coverage, and appearance. For each criterion, there are several questions to be asked. The more question you can answer yes, the more likely the web page is one of a quality. First is authority. Is it clear who is responsible for the contents of the page? Is there a way of verifying the legitimacy of the organization, group, company, or individual? Is there any indication for the author's qualification for writing on a particular topic? Is the information from source known to be reliable? Second is accuracy. Are the source for factual information clearly listed so they can be verified in another source? Is the information free of grammatical spelling and other typographical errors? Third is objectivity. Does the content appear to contain any evidence of bias? 
Is there a link to a page describing the goals or purpose of the sponsoring organization or company? Is there is any advertising on the page? It is clearly differentiated from the informational content. Next is currency. Are there dates on the page to indicate when the page was written, when the page was first placed on the web, or when the page was last reversed? Accuracy focuses on the publication date. The fifth is coverage. Are these topics successfully addressed with clearly presented arguments and adequate support to substantiate them? Does the work update other sources, substantiate other materials you have read, or add new information? Is the target audience identified and appropriate for your needs? The last is the appearance. Does the site look well organized? Do the links work? Does the site appear well maintained? Appearance focuses on the exact area of the site, on how they look or maintain. Integrating digital literacy into the curriculum. There are seven ways to teach digital literacy into the curriculum. First is emphasize the importance of critical thinking. The majority of media we consume today comes from online sources, some of which are more credible than others. Of course, the fact that so much information is readily available to anyone with an internet connection is a decidedly positive thing. But it also means that today's students are more susceptible to subliminal message, misinformation, and fake news. With this in mind, a huge part of teaching digital literacy is helping students become critical consumer of information. Start by encouraging students to ask questions and find answer by going straight to the source and checking for objectivity. Second, use social media for learning and collaborating. Today's students are already active on social media and in many cases, they may already be more adept at using it than their teachers. So the focus shouldn't be on introducing students to the ins and out of social media, but on demonstrating how it can be used in an educational context. For example, Pinterest boards can be used for providing and receiving feedback during group projects. Twitters can be used to create polls for research purposes or find expert sources, and Facebook or LinkedIn groups can be used to connect and collaborate with their peers. Third, provide guidance on how to avoid plagiarism. Although the internet hasn't necessarily made plagiarism easier, it has changed the way it happens, and students may now be a risk of plagiarism even without meaning to. A study published in the journal Higher Education found that many students don't understand plagiarism, but they do want more information on what it is and how to avoid it. For example, students often borrow ideas or use praise they find online without properly citing the original work and are later surprised to learn that this is constitute plagiarism. So another important aspect of becoming digitally literate is learning how to avoid plagiarism by taking good notes, using citation and quotes, and properly supporting a discussion with references. Fourth, teach students on how to manage their own light identity. Regardless of whether we consciously manage it or not, we are live a digital footprint and have an online identity. Students who have grown up using social media are more likely to take it for granted that their data is stored online. And as a result, may not give as much thought to safeguarding their privacy by managing their privacy settings, reading privacy policies, and being as respectful in their online interaction as they would be in person. But in the same way, that not managing an online identity can have negative implications. Taking steps to build a positive one can be usually beneficial to students' career prospects. With this in mind, learning how to safeguard privacy online but also how to share 
The right information and content are important aspect of a well-rounded digital literacy education. Fifth, help students manage digital distraction. Digital tools and online researcher have made learning more effective in many ways. But they've also brought new distraction with them. Research shows that many of us struggle with digital distraction which can make us feel distant and drained and even reduce our enjoyment of experience. Judging multiple media screens can also lead students to multitask, which isn't a good thing considering that research shows that students who multitask tend to have lower grades. So the ability to manage distraction while utilizing digital tools for learning and professional purposes is another digital literacy skill that shouldn't be overlooked. Some example of distraction management strategies include taking tech breaks throughout the day, muting notification while studying, using productivity tools, and citing goals around technology use. Six, provide authentic context for practice. Another important part of teaching digital literacy is finding ways for students to practice using technology in ways that mirror is its real world uses. Whether this means giving students opportunities to practice building their own website and apps or respectfully engage in online discussion. For example, when teaching students about the importance of managing their online identity, you could have them research themselves online to find out what a potential employer would see. You could follow this up with a discussion about their findings and have them list some of the things they would proud of as well as some of the things they'd like to change. And lastly, guide students out of their comfort zone. We all have a comfort zone when it comes to technology, but if we want students to become innovative and well-rounded user of technology, it's important to guide them out of their comfort zone whenever possible. Of course, this will mean something different from each student. For example, some students may already be adept at communicating in short and distinct paragraph and hashtag on Twitter or Instagram. So moving out of their comfort zone might mean sharing their opinion through a more in-deep blog post. In other cases, students might already have experience with blogging, in which case they might be interested in trying something a bit more out of the box, such as video journal or podcast. Whatever the case may be, giving students more freedom of choose and encouraging them to use technology in a new and creative way is one of the best ways to help them hit the ground running once they enter the workforce. Impact of integrating digital curriculum into the classroom on teachers, families, and friends. There are five impacts on it. First impact is take learning everywhere. When your students learn how to use digital media, they can utilize this skill everywhere. Technology is all around them. For example, at home, they probably have smart devices like mobile phones, tablets, computers, and other smart devices. Your students can take their knowledge with them using their digital literacy skills for profound learning outside the classroom. The restriction of time and space fall away opening their minds to independent learning. They can continue their research and writing whenever they go, increasing their independent learning and inquisitive nature. Second impact is interact with peers. Another benefit of harnessing new technology in the classroom, especially in older children in the per- interpersonal computing they can do. When students work on their assignment using cloud environments, they can interact with each other, reviewing, offering encouragement, and making suggestions. This not only helps motivate students to perform better, but it builds collaboration and negotiation skills that they can use throughout their entire lives. The third impact is content connection with teachers. On top of staying connected with their peers during assignment, Teachers become even more important in web-based learning environments. They can access everything their students are doing, which helps evaluate their students' learning potential, peer reviews, and exactly 
what they are working on. Gathering this analytical data helps access each student's performance and ability. Cloud computing gives teachers more visibility over their students' progress. Fourth impact is work at their own pace. Every student has different needs, whether in elementary or secondary school. E-learning allows students to work at a space that's comfortable for them. This helps relieve the pressure of keeping up with others in the classroom. You can track and intervene to adjust the material so that the student can successfully complete the assignment. As educators, by expanding instruction using digital media, you offer support for the needs of individual students. When they connect with their peers, it puts your student at ease, keeping learning fun and interesting for all ages. The last impact is decrease of behavior issues. When your students leave the classroom at the end of the day, they go home and text their friends, share photos, and become instantly connected to the digital world. Since they consume to this constant personal connection, be being in a confined classroom environment can cause frustration and boredom. For many students, they find release by acting out. Thank you for listening and learning with me today. Hope you have learned something. God bless.